in here before. If you want to put your email in the chat, we can uh, get you on the, on the list. But just to sum up last time on the lecture, first lecture, there was a, uh, you know, we're discussing the book, The Little Prince by, uh, by Antoine saint X Paris, And he, um, you know, was this uh, sort of a, a, a guy who, who flew in the air all the time, you know, and he was, he was just this classic Peter Pan figure, but um, he, he, in the little prince, and he claims this is somewhat biographical, he would, uh, he had read about boa constrictors that swallowed their prey and then just sat six months. Uh, uh, hi, uh, you're from Taiwan, great. Well, um, welcome, uh, Edward. Yeah, if you could just put your email in the, uh, in the uh, address, I will, um, uh, you, you know, we'll get you on the, get you a copy of the text. But anyway, that, that, what, what, the, 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 just the quick summary of that was that, uh, so he draws this picture of uh, a snake swallowing, because uh, uh, it just so fascinated him. But, and, it, and it, so he would draw this and show it to people and everyone would look at it and they'd say it was a hat, you know? And, uh, and so then he would draw another picture that showed uh, that inside the hat was, the, was an elephant. I mean, inside the snake. So it's a snake swallowing an elephant. And uh, uh, this of course represented the devouring mother. <laughs> I mean, the hero, the elephant, is is you know the uh, uh, the uh, um, the great hero, and uh, in in many uh, instances, yet um, he and that's where we're going to pick up right now. I'll start with this because now, now the only thing is the the funny thing is though. Then he shows uh, he crashes in the desert. He's in the desert. His, his plane, he's a thousand miles from nowhere, trying to fix his engine. And then suddenly uh, he hears a voice saying, draw me a sheep. And he sees this, uh, uh, the little prince, you know, and uh, uh, the little prince keeps asking him for, for uh, wants him to draw a sheep. So he draws his snake that looks like a hat and uh, he gives it to the little prince. He says, no, I don't want to see a snake, uh, a boa constrictor that swallowed an elephant. I want a sheep. So this is the first person who has noticed that, uh, knows that it's a, it's a boa constrictor that swallowed us an elephant. And he, no one else has, has guessed it. But then he, so he shows him three different sheep. He doesn't like any of them. And then uh, finally, he just draws a box and says, the sheep that you want is in the box. And then uh, the little prince says, that's just the sheep I wanted. So anyway, that's where we kind of left off. Gary, do you have an exercise today? I do. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to, I will end <laughs> about um, uh, 45 minutes before the hour, and then we will... Um, have you questions. Mean 15 minutes before the hour. Yeah, 15 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Correct. 15 minutes before the hour, and then we'll uh, just have discussion. Maybe I'll do a little early because uh, there's been a lot of discussion on this one. Yeah. So, okay. uh, and then Gary will take over at, at 11, and he usually does like an act of imagination exercise. So now we're going to just start with lecture two uh, about the little prince. The first half of the book, The Poeri Turnus is about the book, The Little Prince. The second half is about the book, um, the, a king, the Kingdom with No Space, which you will find is one of the best books you've ever read. But it's not in print, it's in German. I've talked with Jan about this. There's, it's just not available, but it's a wonderful book. But The Little Prince is a good book too. So anyway, this is lecture two. And what lecture two is gonna cover is, um, uh, it's going to cover the difference between the infantile shadow and uh, the uh, and the divine child, because they can be either one. So the unconscious is both 
yes, I am obsessed with it too. I've been looking for that book forever, you know, but I can't find it anywhere. But anyway, uh, so the first, we're going to discuss the difference between the infantile shadow is the little prince, the infantile shadow, which pulls us back into the, into the mother complex, or is it the divine child that leaves us forward into uh, individuation, you know, really into uh, creating the philosopher's stone, you know, or that moving the uh, center of gravity of awareness to the middle plane between the inner and outer worlds where um, we now are in dialogue with a, uh, and are more permeable to the wisdom of nature which we've been cut off from because of our ego uh, is, is just living in a, in this, um, uh, you, you know, the ego is, is living in uh, what, um, what uh, young, young called, what's the first chakra? It's uh, uh, anyway, we're living in the first chakra. Is that um, Muladhara? Yeah. We just, uh, the, the ego lives in Muladhara you know, the first chakra. And so it's uh, the, uh, what, what the um, move, what we need to learn, you know, is who created this body, who created these eyes, who created this, your thoughts, you know, it was an ego. And yet it's very conscious. I mean, how do uh, look at me, I'm moving. <laughs> how did that happen? You know, the improbable state of order. So anyway, uh, we're starting lecture two. Boa constrictor ate the elephant. Uh, Expiri makes the drawing, looks for someone who understands, never finds anyone. And this all foreshadows the tragic end of the book and of Expiri's life. You know, he, he crashed uh, over the Mediterranean in July 1944, right about the time France was liberated, by the way. And... Uh, so in, and in hero myths, usually, so anyway, the, uh, the uh, fact that um, no one understands that the boa constrictor ate the elephant. In other words, that the mother has devoured his hero aspect. Um, and he looks for someone who understands it, doesn't find anyone that recognizes it. The hero within him has been swallowed by uh, the devouring mother, and uh, which was the end of the book and the end of Expiri's life as a poer, eternus, uh, internal youth is what it means. And so there's, a, so this dream that Expiri's living had no lysis, no solution. So in hero myths, normally, if the hero is swallowed by the dragon, the big snake, or the sea monster, or the whale, he cuts the heart out of, or the stomach, from the inside, dances until the uh, monster either dies or vomits him out. Uh, and here the hero animal or the hero is the elephant. And it's the symbolic anticipation of the hero on the animal level of expiry. But here the hero is swallowed and does not come out again. So uh, do you understand this drawing? You know, no one understands it. I don't think he understands it, but um, it's it's wonderfully um, symbolic too. So this lack of lysis in the uh, first dream of childhood shows that there was something weak or broken in the very beginning, something in expiry that cannot escape the fatal aspect of consciousness. Now she's going to go through um, whether we're born defective or we are defective because we don't, uh, we have a moral defect. Were we born defective or do we have a moral defect? And uh, she's, uh, she says she always assumes that the case is not hopeless. So she's going to, she says it's unfair not to. So um, Expiry uh, sp always spoke mockingly of the grown up world and of grown up people who, took themselves so seriously, but are just occupied by trifles. But 
his uh, commanding officer said that's exactly what he was like. He he was uh, a man of integrity uh, and uh, with a taste for childhood pleasures, which were sometimes surprising, but he had unaccountable fits of shyness uh, when faced with administrative stubbornness. And the uh, latter always was his um, bet noir, you know, uh, so it was, and he was a bit disappointing to people when they met him because um, he was a bit of a poseur. You know, he was uh, always gave the impression that he was acting and was not a genuine personality. So uh, this, uh, the, uh, the tendency to go off into these surprisingly childish pleasures was not only a symptom of the puer, um, but also belongs, she says, to creative personality. Creativity presupposes a tremendous capacity for being genuine, for letting go, for being spontaneous. So if one cannot be spontaneous, one cannot really be creative. And you know, the word puer eternus, as we learned last time, came from the book Ovid's Metamorphoses, and it described um, the, the divine child who um, like on Christmas Eve, the birth of light in the Eleusinian mysteries when the, when, the, when the rebirth is announced by the holding up of wheat um, would cry out. He was called the God of Iacus. And uh, that's where the name Pueri Turnus, divine child came from. You know, and it's normally considered positive, but here it's a description of people who who have a mother complex. Um, so um, anyway, most artists and creative people have a normal and a genuine tendency to playfulness. But a, um, a expiry never overcame his rage over administrative opposite, obstinacy. And uh, so he, um, and he, now, now this is going to come up because of the sheep is uh, are we sheep or are we um, what, what the, the dilemma that um, Expiry is facing is, is he going to be a um, sheep or is he going to be this um, special individual, which all, um, all children of the mother, all sons of the mother are very special but it's a false individuality when it's in the puer, uh, in, the, in the womb of the mother, when it never comes out, it's false individuality. And uh, so the sheep comes up. Uh, the, uh, what what um, Jung calls uh, the warmth of the human herd. He said, we can never be far from the warmth of the human herd. So, and it's a modern problem that, uh, is the overwhelming power of the state, the devaluation of the individual when they enter adult life um, is, is up on the minor scale played out in the life of the Puer Eternus. You know, uh, just, and another, I'm just keep admitting people. I wish I could just, there we go, okay. So anyway, um, there's something genuine and justifiable in not wanting to be sheep, this revolt, which people feel at being reduced to the level of sheep uh, and a flock. Now, this is, we're talking about uh, the dilemma that Expiry is facing, about whether he's going to remain in the Puer world or whether he's going to feel what he thinks is to be crushed in the adult world of trifles. So, uh, the, and, and this is really a problem of, in France particularly, and it's a problem of Christian civilization. And she just mentions that this is back in the early mid sixties and seventies. And, uh, you know, the French always like to vote uh, for, um, you know, the hard left, the communists, even though they were actually trying, it was a vote for freedom, you know, but it was just really what she says was a sort of a teenage response to, um, to their revolt against social and collective responsibility. So it's a very complex re revolt against being sheep. You know, okay. Uh, 
Okay, so now we're, we're, remember, we're still talking about uh, expiry here. So, uh, what, so why does expiry meet the little prince in the desert? When things get all dammed up and stuck, generally there's a, generally there's a breakthrough in the form of an archetypal image and he gets it in the desert, you know? So anyway, uh, so like after Moses, this is in the Quran, after Moses uh, lost his only nourishment, his, the fish, um, he took uh, the first angel, Kadir, into the desert. And, uh, but now uh, when, and, and uh, good morning, everybody that's new. If, if you wanna put your, hi, Melissa. If you want to put your uh, email in the chat, uh, we can you know, make sure you have a copy of the text and everything. We're just on lecture two right now. And hi, Angel and um, Arp Arpine. I didn't say hi to you either. Hi. So, hi. So um, anyway, we're going to, uh, I, I'm going to just uh, kind of summarize lecture two and until about uh, 10, about 40, 15 minutes before the hour, as Gary says. And, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion or introduction of anybody that wants to introduce themselves. So uh, anyway, uh, the uh, expiry lands in the desert, the prince appears, this divine child. Why did it appear? And it's because uh, uh, he's all damned up and the archetypal image usually appears at that point. And, um, uh, it's not inevitable that uh, such a collapse, the child image would appear and any archetypal image could, could show up. But this, is, this was the symbol of the, of the child God. And there's a double aspect of the child archetype. She has a little passage in there from Jung on the child archetype. But in one way, it is a renewal of life, a spontane, spontaneity and a new possibility that suddenly appears uh, that changes the whole life situation, either within or without us. And the other aspect of the child archetype is the destructive aspect, uh, which Jung mentioned uh, that was also often an, a ghost, an apparition of a radiant boy who seemed to have something to do with the pagan gods and always appeared in a negative form, you know? Uh, and uh, so now the question is, is the little prince uh, the child God or is he this um, infantile shadow, which is gonna pull him back into the snake where the elephant has been swallowed by the boa constrictor. So when the child motif shows up, we have to decide if it's, whether it's, it's something that should be cut off or repressed because it's the infantile shadow that pulls us back or something creative moving us towards a future possibility of life. So whenever the child appears in dreams, it's always behind us and ahead of us simultaneously. It, behind us, it's the infantile shadow which must be sacrificed for us to become the hero you know, son, go find your father uh, is what, um, you know, the two sons learn when they leave the, the, the spider woman, who is also a devouring mother, the two heroes in, in Native American myths, you know. Um, so it, it's behind us in the, it's the infantile shadow, that which always pulls us backward into being infantile, dependent, lazy, escaping problems, responsibility, and life. Now, this is, this is the problem of the poor Eternus. They live provisional lives. And by the way, that's, I was, I'm a recovering poor Eternus. So uh, ahead of us, when we see the child God, the, the one that's ahead of us means renewal, the possibility of eternal youth. And that means life is a becoming thing. It's continually growing and continually expanding because life wants to um, always create that thing which has never been seen before on land or sea, you know, and, and that's really the, the uh, purpose 
the ontological purpose of us being here is to be the vessel for that new life, you know, but we don't know it, you know, because we're living in Muladhara, we're living in the, in the first chakra, in the womb of the mother somewhat, and don't realize that that's our, our real um, role in, on earth is to be the vessel for the divine, you know, uh, for, to, now, now the, the divine is really this um, place, which you could call the Pleroma, out of which the improbable order of life came, you know. Now in, in Hindu myths, it's, it's uh, symbolized by Vishnu sleeping on the cosmic serpent, you know, and his wife, uh, I always get Lakshmi and poverty is mixed up but i think it's lakshmi massages his calf and then the dream of the universe starts you know well this and, and this is what dna is you know dna is kind of like the dream of the universe you know and so uh anyway this um life wants newness you know and it wants newness we're the vessel of this newness you know and that's the uh, you know young says the whole History of life is the progressive incarnation of a deity. And that means the progressive um, appearance of the divine in at least um, cultural life, you know, and maybe not physically, but at least in with some gifted people. They like Meister Eckhart or people who've had these revelations. Um, uh, so anyway, the great problem is uh, that that expiry faces is uh, um, what what is ruling his life, and uh, sometimes the context of the dreams can tell uh, clearly whether the child is regressive or um, or leading forward into the future, and uh, um, you know if if does it have a fatal aspect that's pulling us back or does it um, have a positive aspect um, where you could say that something childish and silly is happening, but with this childish, childishness and silliness must be accepted because there's the possibility of, of new growth in it. So, uh, you, know, you know, the products of the unconscious are always ambiguous. There's a destructive and a constructive a backward pull and a forward pull, and they're always very closely intertwined. You know, uh, the mother wants her son to go out in the world, but she also doesn't want him to leave her. You know, I mean, it's just this pull back and and future forward. You know, so um, this seems to be what we are confronted with in, in the little prince. One cannot decide whether the little prince is destructive. Um, announcing Expiree's death, or it's the divine spark of Expiree's genius, you know. And uh, so, um, you know, she's going to go into, uh, is, the is the puer born defective or does he live defectively? You know, that he, he, she's, she gives the example is if we eat the wrong thing all the time, you know, and don't tell the doctor, They'll say, hey, your stomach is, something's wrong with your stomach. But uh, you could just as well say, if you would eat the, uh, wouldn't eat the right things, then the stomach is not at fault. So if the ego is inflated uh, and uh, not conscientious, doesn't perform the duties of the ego complex, the, you know, the, the rhizome can never bloom or the flower can never bloom properly. So it's the problem of free will. Can we want the right thing? You know, the Pueri Turner says, I know that everything goes wrong because I'm lazy, but I cannot want not to be lazy. And uh, so, so his neurosis is he's unable to fight his laziness. Therefore, it's useless to treat him as a rascal for whom everything would go right if he weren't lazy. You know, and our, and Von Franz says she's heard this argument many times. And it's partially true because the Puer Eternus cannot make his mind to work. So, um, 
so it appears he can't be saved, you know? And uh, so maybe he was not, he was born that way. And uh, the problem comes up in many neuroses and goes very deep. But Mar uh, Marie-Louise von Franz said she always acts as if the patient can make up their mind because that is the only chance of, of their salvation. If it goes wrong anyway, you can say, well, it wasn't possible for things to have gone differently. So if a person dies as a result of a disease or accident, she says, one, you could say, well, that was because they didn't realize their problem. It's that their fault that they had that fate. But she says, no one has the right to decide that. But she says, on the other hand, nature does have its own revenge. And if an individual can't solve their problem, they are generally punished with something that, uh, you know, ends their life early or something, you know. But it is not the business of others to point this out or to make it a moral issue. One should always take the hypothesis that um, the other hypothesis, the person could not do it. The structure was defective in the beginning, like this was um, Expiree's childhood dream was of the boa constrictor that swallowed the hero and that, that he was born that way. And so that's her question. She thought that he was a very good analyst because all of his symbols are so um, evocative of the Poer problem. But um, she says he came very close to realizing it himself. But um, she says all her Poer uh, uh, patients always knew exactly what was going on. They were very conscious of it, you know. And, and she says she had to be alert as a fox because they never, even though they knew everything, they couldn't do anything, you know. They knew what to do, but they wouldn't do it, you know. So they were very aware of it, but they couldn't do anything about it. So um, anyway, his, his soul is, uh, uh, he, said that, he said that the only thing, he wrote to his mother that, oh, I missed a little bit. So as long as the catastrophe has not taken place, it's better to take the other attitude um, to create a hopeful atmosphere and, pos and you know, hope for the free will. She says sometimes it might, they might pull out. Some do, some don't. You know, and you can say if they do pull out, it was because they did good deeds or it could be an act of grace. You know, uh, so is it your good deeds which led you to curing your neurosis or was it um, through the grace of the unconscious? You know, the unconscious helped you. Because I see people with deep neuroses whose unconscious is just screaming at them to heal themselves, but they don't hear it. You know, like my, mine uh, had a dream one time where the uh, uh, unconscious says, it's, we're trying to shake, stir you in every way that you can be stirred, you know, and then the, the anima would take the clock hand and push it to the top of the hour and say, it's time, it's highest time. So the unconscious is very urgent that we heal ourselves. So when you talk about the grace of God or the grace of the unconscious or the self, it is there, it's alive, it knows what you're doing. And it's trying to send you the message if you can hear it. But our problem is we don't hear it. So um, anyway, um, she is, is just saying that uh, we can't. So something is constantly wrong, uh, going wrong in both the little prince. And, uh, and one does not know whether it's uh, Expiree's moral fault or whether he couldn't just help it. He just could not help it. Was there some problem from the very beginning which prevented him from solving his problem? You know, it was funny because his mother always uh, was, was thinking he was, had died and she would put on mourning clothes and then she'd find out he, she, he didn't die and she was disappointed. You know, I mean, she was sort of this mother that was, wanted her son to die early. You know, and uh, anyway, um, now now uh, we're going to um, uh, 
the the if the ego is able to change the unconscious changes too you know and uh, we you, you can if your ego attitude changes the dreams respond you know so what Jung said, like if you would draw a dream, you would amplify a dream and you would color it, you'll never be the same afterwards, ever. You'll be forever changed by that act. And the unconscious realizes it, that you did that and it changes. So it leads somewhere. So if the ego, the conscious attitude changes, so do the symbols that come from the unconscious. So uh, that's what um, moves forward. That really is the divine child you know this active imagination that you do through drawing or through dream amplification i would say interpreting a dream or drawing a dream is about the best active imagination you can do there's two aspects of it medium of expression the wordless uh, picturing of the dream and then the um throwing meaning on it through amplification in words you know so it, it, in The Little a Prince, uh, through the whole book, uh, von Franz is always going to interpret him in, in a double way, both as the infantile shadow and as the self. So she's going to say, on the one hand, this was uh, Expiree's salvation. And he just didn't, something, there an accident cut it short. And on the other hand, it is, uh, he was fated. To have this happen you know and uh so um anyway uh she's uh, he's she's always going to interpret it both ways and she says okay so th here's the first thesis that it is the infantile shadow could easily be proven he's um the little prince is the only one who understood the story of the bow constrictor and the elephant so that means he's and it was a remnant of childhood so he's the infantile shadow and we have a letter from asc where he says that um, the only refreshing um, source that he finds were memories uh, from childhood, like the smell of Christmas candles. And uh, so, and he also said that his soul right now was completely dried up and he's dying of thirst. So he's in the desert. So he has this nostalgia for childhood. And it was typical, he wrote his mother uh, about it. So he's still in the mother complex. So, um, uh, but on the other hand, it could, could be the divine child. Um, the um, fact that this child appears on earth is not negative. It, 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 it's, um, it's not the, uh, it could not be the apparition of just the infantile shadow because as we shall hear later, the little prince comes down from the star to the earth. So it's an interesting parallel. Uh, Expiry crashed from up above to the desert and from the stars above, something else has come down. And it is the little prince who comes down from a planet. So for the first time, the two things meet on the earth. The one who knows what the snake swallowing the elephant means and, um, and uh, Expiry. They're meeting on the earth. Uh, so the star prince who was far away in the cosmos and, and Expiry who was flying, constantly flying in the air uh, at, at the same moment land on the earth. And so this is not the infantile shadow, but because as soon as it touched the earth, as soon as it touched reality, it's now in an, this ambiguous uh, pos position where it is... Um, is not uh, a star ch child anymore. So now if it, this could be realized and lived and become a part of future, it's not a pull backwards. And that's the problem. Are you going to live it or is it just gonna be an unopened letter that you, know, you just let go by and there is no change in the conscious attitude. So, um, it, it's no longer an infantile shadow, but a form of realization, which goes on all the time. And for to become more conscious means practically to become more and more into the reality of things. And this means disillusionment. And disillusionment 
means you're disillusioned with ego can't every dream every fairy tale tells you the same message ego can't help you now the only way you can get help the only way you can lift the curse or cure the enchantment is through disillusionment that the ego is in is its own god okay you have to become disillusioned of the fact that the ego is this self-contained deity you know you have to realize that it's it's an it's a, it's an empty gong you know it's just this clanging symbol or whatever saint paul used to say about it you know it's just uh, nothing you know and it needs to become uh, to become whole and healed you know the word religio comes from ligio which means to connect and re means again so what you want to do is you want to connect this marvelous evolution of life the ego consciousness which is has emerged from nature and can now look back on itself but it can't spin off you know and think it's its own god it needs to reconnect religio religature like the ligaments between bones needs to reconnect with nature that produced it. It can't spin off like that because that's that's what makes us sick, and that's why the ego is sick. And uh, uh, so, anyway, the greatest difficulty that we drag along from childhood is this sack of illusions um, that um, we bring into adult life. And so the, a subtle prog program uh, consists in giving up illusions without becoming cynical. How can we give up the, our childish illusions without becoming cynical? And uh, now she, uh, let's see, let's see, we'll go in here. Uh, she just mentions, now here's the opposite of the queer, just for the opposite of the queer. She's analyzed orphans who had to grow up when they were four or five years old. You know, they had to become mature. I, I actually had a friend who ran away from home when he was five years old. Seriously, you know, uh, he was actually born in 1918. So, I mean, it's been a few years since he died, but he just, um, you know, started becoming an itinerant laborer at different farms, but he was independent since he was five. So anyway, she's just analyzes these orphans who become mature very early and grow up uh, very quickly. But she noticed that the hardships of life, which forced them to this, but you can generally tell from a rather bitter and falsely mature expression that something went wrong. They were pushed out of childhood too soon and crashed into reality. And if you anal analyze such people, you find that they have not worked out the problem of the childish illusions. They just cut it off and put it in the corner. So um, they, uh, that their growth is hampered that they, she says it's a horrible analysis because you have to bring the childish illusions back in to their ego consciousness and deal with them properly. They have to reemerge and have to be dealt with properly. So um, anyway, um, it's just an interesting that she brought up the, the opposite of the puer. And uh, so this is, uh, she says this, she meets this in, in people who say they can neither love nor trust anybody, you know, uh, so that, that life in that situation, she says life has no meaning because there's no puer in their life there's no i mean they have lost that magical aspect of the eternal youth okay and, and again if you want to know what that means i always tell the story of the fairy hill the fairy hill everyone lives forever they don't need anything they don't want anything they'll never die they're never sick so you don't think they lack anything but what do they lack they go and they steal babies out of cradles and then they live leave a wizened old elf there 
who looks like the baby. And then they take the baby back to the fairy hill because what's lacking in the fairy hill? The promise of youth. Okay, so these people who uh, that you meet that can't love nor trust anyone uh, have lost that puer aspect, which needs, so it's very important, you know, but um, we're going to uh, learn. I mean, this is, this is a very long book. So we're going to learn a lot about what this means. You know, um, we're, we're, you know, we're just kind of covering the uh, sort of a, a sketchy outline right now. So um, anyway, uh, the, um, uh, you can, um, we can go on about the, uh, the orphans. She goes on to quite a, a, a while about that. People who have shelved their, their puer aspect and their feelings or their demands uh, and lost the capacity for, for trust always feel not quite real, not quite spontaneous or really themselves. They feel only half alive and um, generally uh, don't even take themselves as real. And she says, if we decide to, to put the divine youth in us in the corner, it means that we're not taking ourselves seriously. You know, and she says that then we just become actors. She says, we become the poseur that, um, you know, the ex was. And uh, uh, so, and if you are honest with yourself, you know that you spent your whole life acting. Otherwise, um, you know, that, that's the aspect of losing all spontaneity. You lose all, all this playfulness and spontaneity when you lose the puer. And that's why she's using this example of the, of the orphans she's analyzed who really did it. They got rid of the puer completely because they were forced to do so. So um, anyway, the, um, so the one who succeeds in disentangling uh, uh, what is, is destructive and what is the saving thing in, in the child is um, it's an immensely and subtle, difficult, subtly and difficult thing to accomplish. So the divine child or the star prince whose expiry meets in the desert asks for a sheep. And we learn he has come down to fetch a sheep to take it back with him. And later in the story, it is said that on the planet, there is an overgrowth of bow bow trees, which are continually sprouting. And I don't know if you've ever seen a bow bow tree, but they are pretty funny looking. That's a bow bow tree. And that's uh, his, his, his little planet is being overrun with these. They just sprout up everywhere. Of course, this is the, this is the devouring mother. <laughs> the little prince's planet is being taken over by the devouring mother. And he needs the sheep to uh, eat, you know, the, uh, the sprouts so that they don't, the roots don't all grow into the earth and explode it because there's so many baobab trees. So um, anyway, uh, that she's going to go on and talk about the sheep. And uh, now Expiry says of himself uh, that we're looking at, going to look at the symbol of, the star prince, uh, the prince does not explain the reason for the, uh, for the sheep, but uh, we find out later. So there's no bad, this is expiry writing of himself. There's no bad outer fate, only an inner one. There comes a moment when you are vulnerable and your mistakes seize you and pull you down like a sort of a whirlpool. Now, this is exactly what happened to him in 1944 when his plane went down. And he's just saying that, that it's no, it, there's no such thing as a bad outer fate, only an inner one. And he's speaking of the, uh, that there's no such thing as a chance crash. And the day you have a crash is the result, whole result of an inner and outer process. So he says, and it's not the big obstacles that, that will cost us, but little ones. Three orange trees on the edge of an airfield. 
30 sheep, which you fail to see in the grass, which suddenly emerge between the wheels of your plane and it's all over, you know? And uh, so um, she's gonna go on, uh, the, the fact that the sheep is the, you know, they used to uh, have sheep on the airfields to keep the grass down. And uh, there was uh, occasionally accidents where people would run into the sheep. So it became the symbol of the fateful thing, which one day will kill him or kill the poor Eternus, in this case himself. And so the symbol of the sheep is the fatal enemy to him. And it has, and you know, she just mentions in Greek, it means the walking forward animal or the walking forward thing. And that it always follows the ram wherever it goes. And if the wolf chases the ram off the edge of the cliff, 300 sheep will go over with it, you know. And so that's why uh, one talks of as a person, as a silly sheep, uh, and uh, who just is, uh, they're like a lemming, you know. And it stands for mass psychology, this tendency to be infected by mass movements and not stand up for our own judgment and impulses. So the sheep is the crowd animal, and there's a crowd man or woman in each of us. Uh, and uh, he, she, he gives some examples, but it also has a, a strange relationship with, uh, with um, the divine child. You know, uh, the Madonna is always pictured with the lamb and the Christ child, you know? And uh, so the lamb is a representative of, of, of the divine child doesn't have to be Christian. Christian is just a, a, well, in the West, let's say, I don't know how often it shows up in other uh, parts of, of the world. But anyway, um, it, the, we, it, you know, the Levant were, were hurting people, you know, so um, the sheep was very important to them, you know, as hurting, hurting people. All right, so, um, so what it means is the sheep is the totem animal of the God. The animal nature of the, of the God is the, the lamb. So it's, it's, that's an important image, you know. Hi, Tim, we're just, uh, uh, we got a few uh, minutes left and then we'll have some discussion. So uh, we're just getting into the aspect of what is the sheep. We're trying to talk about what the sheep is. So when the divine uh, child appears as an animal, he is a sheep. So that's his anthropomorphic form. The one, his animal form is the sheep. And uh, now it's very interesting. She, she tells uh, a lot of things about the sheep uh, the, that, um, that uh, the lamb clouds, the fleecy clouds are little, little children little innocent children, and uh, that the sheep are the ones that are most evilly, easily affected because uh, they're the symbol of innocence, that by the evil eye and witchcraft, they're bewitched more than any animal and can be killed by the evil eye. And what she's saying is that they attract evil because opposites attract each other. So in the, the sheep, as a symbol of innocence is also the one that's most easily affected by the evil eye. And the, um, so innocence is a challenge to the powers of darkness. So in the practical life of the poor Eternus, the man who's not disentangled himself from the eternal youth archetype, one sees the same thing. They're very innocent. There's a tendency to be believing naive and idealistic. Uh, therefore, um, automatically to attract people of uh, disrepute, let's say. Um, they attract dubious women and their friends. You don't have a good feeling about them. And this is uh, because they have the wrong kind of idealism. They're very idealistic, but it's the wrong kind of idealism. And... Uh, and so they are attracting dubious women and cheats. And uh, what else does she say? Uh, uh, 
yeah, cheats and deceivers because they're they they are idealistic, but they are innocent and naive, and their idealism is not something very constructive, and uh, so they attract these dubious people. And she says you can't tell a, a Depoir that because you'll be suspected of jealousy and not listened to. Because the only way a Puer can learn is through disillusionment, disappointment, and bad experiences. Warnings do no good. They, we only learn by experience. And uh, um, so they, they'll never wake up from their innocence and actually their naivete of living in this fantasy realm. You know, disillusionment is what cures them. And so, um, it's, and he says, it's as if wolves, wolves, crooks, and destructive people instinctively see such lambs as their legitimate prey because they were made for each other, the innocent one and the one who takes advantage of the innocent. So this naturally leads us into the, um, so she's just saying the, the funny thing about um, religion is Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep, you know, but this has a destructive uh, side. If Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep, we should, we should not think or have our own opinions, but just believe naively, you know. Uh, she says, if we can't believe in the resurrection of the body, a mystery that nobody understands, she says, then we must just accept it. And just shut our eyes and believe. Now, I don't want to, I'm not bad mouthing Christianity, but she's just uh, trying to uh, talk about what the sheep is that has a destructive side to say that Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep. And, um, you know, and they discovered this too uh, in, um, in, uh, in the Grail legend. You know, the Grail legend was a, was a real revolt against the fact that Christ is the shepherd and Christ is the sheep. sheep. I mean, that we are the sheep because it was uh, the individual way, you know, and uh, it's always uh, represented. Uh, let me see. Well, well, I, have to, I want to finish here too because uh, we got to, uh, I want to have some discussion. But anyway, uh, it gets into the sheep is really, it, it represents the mother complex, you know, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, it is this aspect of the mother complex. And uh, um, so, uh, but what is the cure for the Puer Eternus? It is to become the crowd man, okay? It is to become the sheep. She says, it's, it's a very dangerous cure, but it is the cure. And the cure for this false, individuality of the poor, this false feeling that they're very special, is to realize at least there's another side of them that is just somebody or just nobody. I mean, in other words, you need that sense of reality to disillusion yourself that um, uh, you are the child of the great mother and you were uh, this megalomania inflation of the Poeri Turnus. So it's not just for everybody, but for the Poeri Turnus, they need to, you need to put them in the, in the military and, and have somebody, you know, tell them you're just number so-and-so, make sure, you know, you keep your uh, area clean, you know? So it is, um, it's the antidote for the poison of the mother complex. So, and, and so is going to work and behaving like everybody else and not someone special is is the cure, but it's a temporary cure. It's only a first step in pulling us away from the personal mother. So once you've been pulled away from the personal mother, by becoming the crowd man, then you can go back and try to start over and not be the crowd man. But the crowd man is so like cures like, dangerous situation is cured by a dangerous situation. To become a crowd man, is a very dangerous thing, but it helps us against the danger of false individuality, which one develops with the medicine, with the mother complex, but the medicine is very dangerous. So the star prince wants a sheep could be interpreted positively. Um, 
in his ideal isolation, he needs the company of the crowd soul. So in his ideal isolation on the planet, all by himself, the star prince, he needs the company of the crowd soul, which is represented by the sheep. And uh, this is what Jung said about, we all need the warmth of the human herd. You know, we need to have the feeling function. We need eros. We need relatedness. We need to be a part of something, you know. And so, the, and that alone, that crowd soul would enlarge his uh, world. And also, if he brings a sheep to his star planet, he's bringing a little bit of earth, earthly instinct up there. So there is something about bringing the sheep up that is extremely positive. And remember, she's going to read every symbol as both the infantile shadow and as the saving thing. Because she doesn't know whether ex was fated to die in his crash or it was just an accident. You know, so she's going to not assume either. So um, it's, uh, uh, but you could say that um, uh, on the other hand, the, that he's, uh, the fact that uh, he brings that instinct up to his planet to eat the bow bow tree, which is the devouring mother, which is destroying his planet with its roots. He's pitting one instinct, the, the mass crowd man against the mother instinct and letting him fight it out, you know, but he's unconscious of it. And so one instinct just pulls away from the other. Uh, so, um, but he wants to pull the sheep up into the stars. The sheep is something that walks on earth. So in order to have it on the star, he needs to come down to the earth and need, be, needs to be pulled down into reality. And, you know, on the emerald tablets, you know, Hermes goes up through the seven heavens. And then when he gets to the highest heaven, he says, he realizes this is not, this is not what I need. My strength will only perfect it when I return to the earth. So he returns from the seventh heaven back to the earth because he's a living being. You know, we are living beings, at least now. So all of our um, salvation needs to be in, um, in some context, um, it have context uh, be related to the earthly principle. You know, so um, I don't know if there's not that much more. Um, well, I, I she mentions the Puer Eternus. You can never tell whether they're cured or not because they always have a really good story, you know. <laughs> and you think everything's going just marvelous, but then it turns. And then he, she, she says, um, should, does the, the sheep in the box, when you assimilate something intellectually, you put it in a box, the concept is a box. So when, when Expiry impatiently puts the sheep in the box, he accepts the idea, but only as an idea. So it exists only in his brain. And, uh, but the little prince thinks the design is, is as good as a real sheep. Now she does say, uh, does, do we kill the artist in ourselves when we uh, leave the Puer a world for the adult world? And she says, well, that didn't happen to Goethe. You know, uh, Goethe was a poer uh, and in the mother complex. And what he did, uh, you know, was his first book was The Sorrows of Young Werther. And that used to be, by the way, one of the most popular books ever written. You know, it's about this young boy who falls in love with this beautiful girl, but she marries somebody else. So he ends up shooting himself. So, you know, it's, <laughs> that's the book. But anyway, um, so, you, you know, Goethe killed the poer in himself, but his next book, and that's what he says is the difference between Goethe and an expiry. And she also mentioned the romantic poets. The difference between Goethe on the one hand and the romantic poets and uh, expiry on the other hand was that every one of Goethe's books showed he lived his art. You know, his art, and him were, he was really living his art in, in his life, where there was an aspect of expiry and of the romantic poets that they never left this um, 
sort of never never land that they existed in so they didn't come down to the earth where Goethe was relentless about uh, living in fact he was actually as she mentions he worked almost countless hours as a bureaucrat in the Weimar Republic you know <laughs> answering every letter that he got from all these uh, citizens with complaints you know and uh, but he did it, uh, you know, uh, what Young used to, to always tell himself when he was doing the Red Book, he'd say, he says, he says, uh, I live at 228 Seestrasse, Kusnacht. I have a wife. I have five children. And I have a job, you know. I mean, so he's, he's earth, and, and he, that's what he says at the at one time is that the cure for the poor is work. And she says, well, um, somebody said, well, Expiree worked really hard. How can you say he didn't work hard? She says he did not, he only worked hard at what he was possessed by. And it doesn't count if you only work very, very hard until exhaustion by that thing that possesses you, like Nietzsche did too. She says you need to do the boring work that you don't want to do through sheer willpower. And that is the uh, cure. So anyway, um, I, I, we got a few minutes left. Um, maybe uh, everybody could, uh, the new people could just, uh, uh, if they want to, just, um, you know, say a few words. Uh, uh, Zaid, I know, could you pronounce that one more time? It's Zaid or Zaid? It's uh, Zaid. Zaid. Okay, yes. Zaid, where are you from? Hi, everyone. I just, uh, I saw the Facebook group, so I'm from the UK. Okay, great. Well, great. Yeah, I'm glad you made it. I think uh, we probably lost a couple people from the UK because of the time change, you know, but uh, welcome and I uh, hope you come back. Uh, Melissa, uh, where are you from? Or do you want to say, or you can put it in the chat if you want to. Uh, it's okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, I am from, uh, I'm from Mexico, but I am also from Canada. I live in Canada. Okay, and great. I also saw the post on the Facebook group and okay, yeah, I'm a great. student of psychology. So All right, I'm very great. interested in, uh, yeah, in Jungian um, analysis. So I am actually uh, taking therapy with a Jungian analyst. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm now that's, possessed by it. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah. Well, well, welcome. And I hope you, uh, you. Keep, keep coming back. We have a, 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 uh, um, uh, this is this is pretty interesting book. I think it'll get even more interesting. Uh, Edward, uh, did you? Uh, you're from Taiwan, correct? Did you uh, want to say anything? Or uh, I'm, you know, some people don't have microphones. I know, but uh, if you don't, well, that's fine. But you're from Taiwan, uh, so I'm assuming you're from like uh, Taipei or uh, something. I'll have a. Okay, that's fine, Edward. Don't worry about it. Now, James, uh, I'm, oh, I, I think you're still you're connecting uh, by audio. And Arpine, you've been here before, and Angel's been here. So, so anyway, um, uh, why don't we? Does anybody have any comments? I, I think we lost a lot of people this week because of the time change. We went from daylight savings time this uh, weekend. So, um, uh, anyway, uh, Tim, do you have any uh, uh, words of wisdom for us today? Oh, yes, plenty of words of wisdom, but I'm okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, um, I think I misconstrued the time, so I yes. got, got here kind of late, but um, I'm gonna have to read everything that Jan gave us here. Let's okay, sure, that. yeah, and we'll have it on, on uh, YouTube too if you really want to okay, review great. it, but anyway, it's um, uh, you know, we're just gonna keep going through this one. I, I think it's necessary to go through it, uh. Really, I uh, because it's so uh, it, it's fast moving, you know. Really, um, so I'm I'm curious, Craig. You talked about uh, you know the Grail being a, yes, you know, individual, you know, sort of the opposite of, of the sheep, you know, following. Yes. Could you could you comment on that? A little well, further? yeah. I mean, this this is this wonderful uh, uh, era. It was almost the early arrival of, I'm not, I, Carlos is coming right now. I think he, he didn't realize. Carlos is from Mexico too here. Um, uh, 
Well, um, the, the, the wonderful story of the grail, you know, is this individual quest for uh, the grail, uh, the treasure hard to attain, the philosopher's stone. It's actually sort of a, uh, a, uh, uh, an analogy for the philosopher's stone of alchemy. But, you know, the, the wonderful story uh, that uh, at, the, um, at the end of, of the King Arthur's story is, um, you know, they're all seated at table. Carlos, I don't know if you realize that the, there was a time change. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, some in the United States, they always have this daylight savings time thing. And, you know, I don't know, fall, I always get it mixed up. Come uh, spring forward, fall back, I don't know. But anyway, um, here it is. They are seated at table, uh, seated at Arthur's round table. And, uh, the, and, they, and Arthur said that no one at the table could eat until a miracle occurred. And uh, no one was worried because miracles or synchronistic events always happened a lot in this era, you know, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, a, a miracle did indeed occur. The grail appeared, but it was covered with a veil and then it disappeared. And then, uh, Sir Gawain stood up and he says, I propose a quest, I propose a vow that we all go forth to see this grail unveiled. And they said they would do so. So next morning they all gather on their horses to go out in search of the grail. And then they said this wonderful thing. They said they thought it would be a disgrace to go forth in a group like sheep. Each entered the forest, the forest of adventure at the place that he himself had chosen. And they chose that way that was darkest and where there was no way or path because if they followed someone else's footsteps, they would go all together astray. And uh, you, you know, uh, and, and where it all leads, the, the writer says, not even God knows, you know. So the idea there is that we each are incredibly unique. You know, our dream maker speaks to us alone. They don't speak to John and Judy and everybody. They're speaking to us. And it's this wonderful dance between our life and the outer world and our life in the inner world, where the inner world is trying to manifest itself in the outer world. And it's also trying to give us balance, you know? And also the, the idea I think too is that, the, well, anyway, Gary, I mean, the, this is the opposite. This occurred, you know, in the, uh, around a thousand AD. It was at the age of the second fish coming into being. So, you, you know, the, the Piscean age, has two fishes, one points upwards, which is the vertical fish. And that was supposed to be the first thousand years of Pisces. And then the second fish is horizontal. That kind of represented uh, what was called the, uh, the uh, age of the Antichrist, but it really means the age of the anti-self. The, the age of not listening to the center anymore, where the ego spins, you know, uh, widening and widening and, uh, you know, in a widening gyre, the falcon can't hear the falconer. It's where the ego is now. So it's a horizontal world now, not a vertical world, where the upper world, world and the lower world communicate. Now it's all horizontal. Almost and, sounds like a puer eagle, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. One that just goes off and thinks it's its own deity, you know, doesn't listen to the falconer anymore, you know. And uh, uh, the uh, idea there is uh, um, that this grail legend appeared right at that transition from the vertical to the horizontal. And of course, the, the horizontal led to 
uh, to uh, the age of discovery, uh, to Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, you know, and uh, all the, uh, you know, wonderful developments of the co uh, rational mind, you know, to the French Revolution. And I don't know whether there, that was somewhat ambiguous, but at least it was something different than being just a king and everything. But anyway, um, now I wanted to apologize to everybody that got here like an hour late because uh, uh, we, you know, had this stupid time change here. Russell, I'm sorry. I think, uh, you know, it was, I, I just discovered it. I, I didn't even know today was the change. I discovered it because my clock, suddenly I lost an hour while I was getting ready for this. Oh, no. So anyway, and hey, uh, Fabian. Now I want to mention too, even though we don't aren't having um, uh, much time left, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gary. Gary does normally just an exercise in active imagination at the last 30 minutes. The first like an hour uh, or so, we just go over the readings. Now, if you don't have the the text uh, uh, by Marie Louise von, von, von Franz of the Puerto Turnus, if you put your email in the chat, I will get you a copy. And uh, we only went through the first two lectures. And uh, so we're in the first half of the book about the little prince. And uh, uh, next week will be lecture three. And then um, the second half of the book is just a wonderful, one of the great experiences of my life was uh, reading Marie-Louise von Franz about uh, the kingdom without space. It's just a very, it's a very magical book. It's just absolutely magical, and I had dreams about it too. Uh, many dreams where the where where these young boys go around, and uh, and these this person looks through his window, and he sees all these young boys looking at him, and, and then they run off. I mean, these are sort of uh, like Peter Pan type characters, you know. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful story. But anyway, Gary, uh, yeah. Jan, if you could get send us your poem too, I'd I'd love to hear it. Okay, Gary, I am turning it over to you, and I am sorry again. I apologize to everybody that uh, kind of missed out on the lecture. It was my uh, it was uh, circumstances beyond our control because of the thing. Uh, and next time I'll end a little early, or so we can talk about it better. Okay, Gary, it's all yours. Since we uh, have some new people, I think I'll spend just a minute or so uh, talking about, you know, why we do what we do in this, uh, this part of the, uh, you know, the presentation. But, you know, Jan has got up here on the chat uh, in 47, something which I thought, oh, this is just perfect to lead off with. And it starts off, we should now consider the sheep in the box. When you assimilate something intellectually, you put it into a box. A concept is a box. So, you know, it, it's, I think Jungian is this, just this fast, fascinating, you know, intellectual exercise. But then the whole question comes down to how can we bring this down to uh, experiences, you know, and, and so, and, and, and how do we, how do we have felt experiences out of this, you know, rather than just an intellectual assimilation. And so that's, that's what we look at in, in this part of the, uh, at the meeting. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the most popular form, I think, is like, you know, you can do active imaginations and you can do an active imagination on a, on a fantasy where you amplify it and then you kind of get an idea of, you know, the things that are, you know, maybe coming up from the unconscious or you can do dream work um, and the one that I'm kind of interested in is, so Craig does active imaginations. And I think active imaginations are, are probably one of the most interesting things to do. And, it, and it's, but they're also the most difficult. Um, so, you know, literally in, when Craig does an active imagination, you know, he imagines this descent into the earth with seven levels and at each level he leaves a piece of clothing behind where the clothing is is you know a part of his persona now in my mind you know what we're trying to do is you know we're trying to literally you know we're trying to 
back off on the conscious control because we're going down more and more so that when we actually get to the point where the imagination will occur, you know, these things are, are coming up from the unconscious. And this is, this is difficult. You know, I, 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 I work with this and you know, mostly I'm not successful. And then, but the one that I wanted to do today is it's, it's more, you can think of it as liminal dreaming. And this is best done, you know, we're going to go through it. It's probably not going to, it'll get you into a really relaxed state. And I don't think you're going to have all the stuff coming up because really this is best done, like, you know, as you're going to sleep, which is a little bit tough because you tend to just fall asleep or when you wake up, instead of getting out of bed, kind of go through this exercise and then watch what rises. But the interesting thing about this is that an, an active imagination, you know, it can be this really this difficult long wait for things to come up. With this one, it's, it's kind of the flip case. It's like you'll get all these weird images coming up and you can't pull them back over to the conscious side. So, you know, e either one, you know, has its, uh, you know, its, its issues. So, but this is, yeah, it's called liminal dreaming. And uh, we're gonna start off with an exercise. And the exercise, you know, you'll, you'll kind of wanna remember this and I'll, I think I'll send out a text for it. So that you can, cause this, this takes practice. Most of these things I do are not going to work the very first time through. And like I said, this should really be done on rising or when you go to bed or, you know, and, and it should be done laying down, you know, but we're going to go through it and, you know, you'll get, you'll get a feel for it. And so let's start by uh, everybody kill, kill your videos so that, you know, you don't feel like anyone's looking at you or anything. And then uh, we will begin. So I want you to get as relaxed as you possibly can. And together, we're going to take three deep breaths. Let's inhale deeply and exhale with an audible sigh. Ah. <sighs> Inhale, filling up, exhale, letting go. One more time, inhale really deep, let it out. Ah. Feel as if you're letting everything go. Feel the earth beneath your feet. Feel your body resting on the chair, which is resting on the earth. And feel as if the earth is completely supporting your body. Allow your awareness to move towards sound. Listen for the most distant sound you can possibly hear. Allow your awareness of sound to move closer and closer and closer. And then just let all the sounds in your environment just be there. Feel yourself in the center of a circle and all the sounds are on the circumference of the circle. Notice that your body is breathing.
as you feel your body receive and inhale, feel as though the earth beneath you is rising up to cradle and hold your body. As you feel your body release and exhale, feel your body go into the hold of the earth. As the body inhales, the earth rises up to hold support and nurture your body. As you release your exhale, your body lets go into that trustful hold. For the next few breaths, just feel the earth rising in the body, releasing With each exhale, feel yourself letting go just a little more. Scam through the body and let go of any constrictions in the body and the mind. Starting at the number 27, Begin to count the exhales backwards, letting go with each exhale until you get to zero. Your body and your mind are completely free. If you lose, your counting point start again at 27. Wherever you are in the counting, just let it go.
become aware that there is a force outside of you that is compelling you to breathe. Feel as if you can trace your breath back to that source. Now give your body permission to physically fall asleep. Give your mind permission to completely let go. Allow your consciousness to remain awake and aware. As you feel your body breathing in, feel a wave of breath move from the tip of your toes to the top of your head. As the breath moves out, the wave of the breath moves from the tip of the head to the tip of the toes. 10 times. Now feel this wave of breath move from the tip of the knees to the top of the head. And then on the exhale, from the top of the head back to the knees.
feel the way of the breath move from the hips to the top of the head and then back to the hips. Feel the breath move from your navel center to the top of the head and then back to your navel center. Feel the wave of breath move from the center of the chest to the top of your head and back to the center of your chest. Feel the wave of breath move from the throat center to the top of the head and back to the center of the throat. Feel the wave of breath move from the tip of your nose to the bridge of your nose and back to the tip. Now feel the wave of breath from the bridge of your nose to 12 inches above the crown of your head and back to the bridge of your nose.
Now let your awareness rest at the third eye point, the midway point between your eyebrows. Imagine a darkness, the unconscious. You feel a seesaw between being in the darkness and occasionally back to the conscious. From the darkness, images, plays may arise. They are not part of your conscious. Rest there.
feel the unconscious, the dark, slowly begin to recede. Feel that you are on the conscious side. Bring your awareness back to the circle of sound that is around you that we created at the beginning. Take some deep breaths and feel the air, the prana moving deep into your chest and abdomen and then release. Do this several times. Become aware of your outer extremities, your fingers, your toes. Make some small movements with your fingers and toes. Feel yourself sitting in the chair. Begin to move, to stretch. Open your eyes and see If you can remember anything which may have come up from the unconscious side, you can now turn back on your video. So that's, I really like practicing that one. It's um, like, especially like, let's say you feel like taking a nap, you're already halfway there. The idea is you wanna get right to the point of sleep and then over to where the unconscious is letting the images rise. And I've had one experience where my body was fully asleep 
and my mind was fully awake. Mostly it's like, you can't even hold on to the mind awake thing, you know, but it's like, but, you, but when, it, when it works right, you go back and forth between, you know, like being unconscious, being asleep, literally, and going back a little bit to the conscious side. So you just barely are aware of it. But mostly I have problems with, uh, even when that happens, even when I go back over to the unconscious side, I know, or over to the conscious side, I know there was some things there and I can't pull them back across. But it's a, you know, my understanding is that with lots of practice, then you can do it. And it's like, and, and what's really fascinating about this is it's just the exact opposite of the act of imagination where you're going in and your conscious mind is there and you're having to wait and wait and wait for something to come up. And this, the things come up and you can't pull them back across, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you know, take it, it's sort of a, yeah, pick, pick your difficulty. Anybody have any experiences they wanted to uh, discuss? And this big circle that was kind of scary. It just kept coming, 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 coming like this, and then just went over me like that. You know, it's like a oh, wow. Yeah, it nice. was. That's I do do that. I actually, when I'm doing uh, looking, gazing into the darkness, I always try to look in while I'm looking in the darkness out of this third eye you know not real hard but just softly you know rather than out of my regular eyes i try to see just a little right, higher right i like the going from the tip of the nose to the bridge of the nose to i had a little bit hot problems going 12 inches above yeah you know they they did some some there were some neurology studies and uh you know this this guy that was trying to you know get into alpha states and he had access to all the equipment and what he found was the best way to get into the alpha state was to imagine space, like imagine the distance between your eyes or imagine the distance between, you know, your chin and the tip of your nose. So, and then of course, you know, the, the thing with the breath is that just slowly pulls us into this, you know, this really deep, relaxed state. Very embodying too. I mean, I felt the body uh, very closely. It wasn't such an ethereal meditation. Right, right. Yeah, great. Well, that's 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 well, it for this time. And unless anyone okay. else has any comments, I I apologize, Marina and uh, Carlos. Is that okay, Marina? That we start uh, at this time? I mean, they just the only problem was that's the time it is in the United States. I wouldn't mind starting at what would be essentially eleven. Uh, now, but uh, if, is, is, is that can more convenient for you to start? Because uh, you didn't have a time shift, right, Marina? No, okay. Is that time that we were at before better than this, than starting an hour earlier? Oh, can you unmute? Go ahead. Okay, because I because I wasn't aware of the time shift, I just um, I just joined you as as you were doing the exercises, and I realised very quickly what the situation was. Okay. Good. So um, I might I, I missed the beginning of the session. Have yeah. you um, proposed changing the time? Well, I could if you want to, and if there's any objection, Gary or Tim, would you have an objection to starting at eleven instead of ten? No, that's yeah. That's fine okay. With me. All right, well, we'll start at 11 Chicago, which would be, I guess, uh, is that, uh, it'd be four o'clock your time, right, Marina? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, what time, isn't that what time we've been starting anyway? Well, yeah, for you, yeah. Yeah. But see, now we're uh, an hour earlier, but yes, it would be the time we're starting uh, normally, except it's not numerated 11 now instead of 10. So yeah, we could do that. How about you, Carlos? Would you, you didn't have daylight savings time, apparently, shift. So if, if no one minds, we'll just start it at 11 a.m. Chicago, which I think will be 10 a.m. Uh, mountain time, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. That might be better for you, Tim, too. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll do that next time. And I don't think, I'd, I don't have any problem doing it. It gives me an extra hour to, you know, cram for the session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, and thank you so much, Melissa and Zaid and James.
I keep seeing connecting to audio, James. I hope uh, you if at least put something in the text and our pine and everybody um, that was here. So, and, and thank you, Gary. What a wonderful, patient uh, interlude that was. You were very, yeah, so patient. Really nice. Yeah, the patience mm -hmm. that you showed, like a Tim, Tim, I think that's what I like. The, the way it was sort of leisurely, yeah. 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 All right, well, thank you everybody. And we'll see you next time for lecture three. And I'll, if you put your email in there, I will send you a, uh, uh, a text, okay. See you guys later. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye now.